Randy uh, spent 17 years in Illinois prisons, including 12 on death row. Before his exoneration in 2004, he was wrongly convicted and sentenced to die for the 1986 murders of 90 Karen and Rose. But an Illinois State Police investigation in 2000 found that local police had severely botched their investigation. In that case, it was riddled with political corruption that led all the way to the Illinois governor's office. On May 28, 2004, Randy was released. Randy believes that one innocent life lost by execution is not worth 10 guilty persons being executed. Since his release, Randy has been active in the death, anti death penalty movement, speaking to colleges, state legislatures, and communities of faith around the United States. His case is now the subject of a recently published book, Since When Is Murder Too Politically Sensitive? He is a member of the board of directors of Witness Innocence, and it's our greatest privilege to have the end of this I'll urge you to come back and lead some prayer in that community. Let us pray. We come to you this evening, good and gracious God, a God of life, a God of love, a God of mercy. And we thank you for this time together this evening here at the University of Michael. Ask your blessing on all those gathered. We pray in thanksgiving for Randy and his willingness to come and to share this very important story with us in his life and to inspire and help us to think and to open our hearts and to uh, receive the message that he's going to give us. And we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit upon him, guide him, and continue to inspire him and to inspire others uh, to seek that we don't kill others to prove that killing is wrong and that there are those innocent people, those that are innocent that are to be put to death and we want to be people of life. And so we just thank you for this message this evening. We thank you for this week of spiritual growth here at the University of High School. And we just ask you to continue to send your grace and your help and your light into our lives. Yes, all these things through Christ our Lord. Good evening. Thank you, Blackville University, for inviting me. Can uh, everybody hear me okay? Am I a little too close to the mic? Okay. I'd first like to ask you guys a question that I ask once in a while. How many of you here have ever been accused of something that you didn't do that maybe your brother and sister did that mom and dad blamed you for? Has that ever happened? feel so alone being up there, but try magnifying that feeling of hurt and anguish a billion times. It'd be hard to comprehend, wouldn't it? But that's exactly what happened to me. In 1986, small town of Paris, Illinois, there was a brutal murder of a young newlywed couple, Dyke and Karen Rose. They'd just been married three months. Karen worked for a manufacturer in that town and Dyke was a landscaper. They ironically lived right across the street from my aunt. I knew the neighborhood well. And on that July 4th weekend, their home was set fire and they were stabbed over 50 times. And almost immediately, the local prosecutor and the news media got together and said they think it was a drug deal gone down. And they were Open solve it very, very short. Three days after these murders, my friend, Herb Whitlock, and myself had just got off work doing construction work. A hot July day, went to a local pub that was having a few beers, shooting some pool. That was usually my habit after working all day, and then I'd go home, and I had custody of a nine-year-old son for a previous marriage. And my mom was looking. We got off work that day on July 9th. Got a phone call. Bartender says, You got a phone, hand me the phone. 
name is John Deckley, Illinois State Police. And this is uh, Randy, uh, would you turn down the police station? I'd like to ask you a few questions. I'm coming from a conservative farm family, Catholic family, like I was. I was no choir boy by any means, but I was an older boy. And, you know, I had a few uh, run-ins with the law, which was bar room fights, speed tickets, drag racing, things like that the kid does. When I was 35 years old, I hadn't had any problems for about 12 years. All I did was work hard, try to take care of my son. And I told this cop, I said, I'll be right now. And I hung the phone up, and no sooner turned around to tell my friend Earth what had just happened. Five police officers barged into this full bar in the afternoon. Everybody knows what a bar room is anyway. It's a rumor mill, right? Well, picture a town of 9,000 people with 10 bars. And this one's packed, and these police officers came in with their hands on their hips, and they said, come on, let's go. Three through the front door, two through the back. I was humiliated, mad. I told the sergeant, I said, I told you people I'd be right down. Well, they put her in one car and me in another, took us down to the police station, cooperated fully with the police. That's how I was raised. My brother, ironically, had just joined the Illinois State Police after being a city police officer all those years. So I knew, you know, he cooperated with the police. I got nothing to hide. For two and a half hours, we sat there and gave our step-by-step whereabouts, who we were with, what times we were there, and we had a cooperated alibi. In fact, I didn't know it at the time, but a year later, I find out they had my alibi with us in the parking lot confirming what I was telling. We were released, walked back to town, and I was asking her, I wonder why they pulled us out of the bar like that. And he said, well, they just canvassed the neighborhood and talked to everybody they can. And I said, not out of the boat, of course. But you can imagine how that rumor mill circulated for the next eight, nine months. Couldn't go to the store, couldn't go to anywhere without somebody looking, pointing fingers at us, and whispering to each other. This went on for seven or eight months until February 19th, 1987, and there's a knock on my door. Five young police officers walk in, guns run, throw me down on the floor, handcuff me, put leg irons on me, and haul me off and put me in a squad car. And start reading me my rights. And I didn't acknowledge anything, I'm stunned. I get down to the police station, they put me in a holding cell. Again, I'm protesting my innocence. I said, I told you people where I was at and who I was with. What's the problem? So you're being booked for double murder. About that time, my little brother opens the door and walks in. They put him up against the wall and frisk him to make sure he has no weapons on him. Little brother pulls up a metal stool in front of that holding cell and says, Well, I talked to the lead detectives, I talked to the prosecutor, and he said, If you cooperate, they won't seek the death penalty. I said, What do you need to cooperate? I'm already cooperating. He said, If you cooperate and confess, they won't seek the death penalty. Uh, I can't repeat the exact words I was screaming at my little brother then, it wouldn't be appropriate here. But he jumped out from that opening cell and slammed that metal bar stool on the floor and screamed back at me, they don't arrest people that aren't guilty. Now, can you imagine somebody, anybody, in a bar or walking down the street saying things like that? It makes you pause. But your own brother, your own flesh and blood, somebody you were raised with says that to me. They don't arrest people that aren't guilty. So I had screamed back at him, find me in the turn. Being naive to the system, I've never been in any kind of problems other than paying a fine for speeding or a fine for barroom fight. Never spent any time in jail. We ended up with an attorney who was an expert DUI lawyer on my deed, maybe a real estate lawyer on Wednesday and a hand traffic order a criminal case on Friday. But I'm innocent. I think all I do is need a lawyer to represent me. This is a small town. And I got a lawyer that showed up. Cost $40,000, a $15,000 retainer that I didn't have. So I may have straight together some money. 
probably what the case was and where I was at. That's the case that I had to work. Raymond Small. Whether they're Raymond, they formally charged me with murders, and also say they're seeking the death penalty. Of course, I got my mother, my family, and my kids in the background. And I asked for a speedy trial, and I got one. I went to trial on June 4th, my mom's birthday. I had been locked up for about six, seven weeks. So I went to trial wondering what kind of evidence do they have against me. I have corroborated alibi, the state corroborated by the police. And the state used a town drunk, who everybody did, that five DUIs and three convictions for deceptive practices, writing bad checks. And then presently been facing a 30 day jail sentence for another bad check. The other alleged eyewitness, they said, watch me butcher this young couple along with my friend. Her name is Debbie Reinhold. And then we yelled woman who had been a drug addict since age 13, had taken pills, was a prostitute, and said that she was present at the crime scene. This is the two witnesses the state used against me. No physical evidence, no forensic evidence, and I have corroborated that one. So I think I got a pretty good shot in front of the jury, right? The jury of my peers. I was 35 years old at the time. Every one of my jurors, all white, were in their 50s and 60s. Once they used a motive of uh, drug deal on bad, who Debbie Ryan Holt was a drug dealer, my friend Bert Whitlock had a marijuana conviction when he was in college. They tried to say Debbie Ryan Holt and Bert Whitlock had this drug deal on the black roads. And oh, Randy heard his friend, right? Yeah, find the neighbor, they down the road from them all and all. So you see how they try to use guilt as association? Herb never saw the other line go from his life. Everybody knew the town drunk. Their testimony to my jury was they were both present at the crime scene. I allegedly gave the town drunk a ride home in my car. He passes out by me and Herb are upstairs. The drunk says he hears a plant or something breaking. Woman screaming. So he wakes up out of his stupor, uses a credit card to Jimmy the door, and walks upstairs and sees me standing there with a knife in my hand covered with blood. That's what my jury heard from him. Debbie Reinhold says her and her had been in a bar earlier. Her wanted to borrow a weapon, a knife, or something. And she loaned him a lot of late night with us. Five or three eighths inches long. So that was the murder weapon. But yet, both of them testified they were present in the Rose bedroom, watching us butcher this young couple, taking turns using Debbie Reinhold's knife, while she's holding down the camera, saying, patting her on the back, saying, don't worry about a thing, everything's going to be all right. Now, the funny thing is, they both testified that neither one of them saw each other in that bedroom at the crime scene. I was hoping and praying at the time that whatever part of that nap my jury was taking, that they caught on to that. How can two people be in a crime scene watching two people murder two people and not see each other? As I said, no physical friends and cabinets tying into the crime, I was probably out. But my trial lasted five days. I got on the lip stand. I spent over an hour and a half back and back and forth with the prosecutor. Most guilty people don't do that. In fact, even they tell innocent people, do not take a stand, I guess. But I did. And I was hopeful. But that's the evidence they used against me other than the police and the firefighters that talked about finding a broken lamp. And Debbie Reinhold says she saw a broken lamp, somebody was holding a piece of it top of the stairs, and that was the crown jewel to show that this drug addict, mentally ill woman was present at the crime scene. That was the centerpiece of the prosecution's case. That, in fact, she said this was her night. So anyway, that, that arson investigator got up there and said, yeah, it was an incendiary fire started by a flammable liquid. And 
Well, I didn't have any experts to testify. I have my attorney. They considered the firemen and the police the crime scene experts because they were there. So I was hopeful that the next day they charged the jury and they were going to go out and deliver it. And after six and a half hours of sitting in the holding cell waiting, I got the call, the jury was back. So I went in there to sit down and I watched the jury file in and I'm looking, trying to see a look on their face. I couldn't see their face because they were all looking at the tops of the shoes. So I immediately had a sinking feeling in my gut that this is not going to be good. And by the time they handed the verdict to the bailiff and the bailiff handed to the judge, back to the bailiff, and the jury read it aloud, I'm sitting there holding my breath, listening for two words, not guilty. And I didn't hear anything but one word. And I looked at my attorney, his face got white, and then I heard my mom wave behind me. And then I realized, they just convicted me of this double murder, I got nothing to do with it. Immediately 12, deputy sheriff surrounded me, put leg irons on me, walked me out. The judge asked my attorney, said, you ready to present mitigation or aggravation evidence for sentence? He said, no, your honor, I need a week or two. He said, it starts first thing in the morning, Mr. Cole. So he never even prepared for an eventual guilty verdict. I went back to the courtroom the next morning to get up and call the jury back in. And the prosecutor gets up there and lays that five inch knife down on the rail of the jury box and talks about how violent an individual I am. And he had four battery convictions over the period of seven or eight years, but I had none in almost 11 years. And he used that as why I should be here today. Never used to left on me by my life. The jury went out, they were gone 10 minutes. Again, they filed in, their heads hanging down, and they gave me the death penalty. Again, they heard my kid, my mom scream, and it was like sitting on a bed of hot coals, listening to that, and like reaching over, just turn the light switch off on your life, do not. It's an out-of-body experience. You think that this is really not happening. You want to wake up from this nightmare. But it is reality. It was happening. I was getting a dose of what the justice system is about. And off to a prison I went. I spent the first 33 years on death row reading the law, preparing for my direct appeal to be heard. And all the guys on death row said, I don't even want you to read and study and pass and everybody gets denied the right to feel now and all. I said, you don't understand, I'm innocent. They just, you know, walk on. So by the time the first part of the fourth year rolls around, I finally get my appeal heard from the judge. And I got my hopes up after the argument. Ninety days later, I get the answer. Denied, they affirmed my conviction and my death sentence and set my first execution date. So again, after almost four years, my hopes are dashed again. Then I realized this is not going to be an easy situation to get out of. It's not going to be quick. So after that, I was kind of disheartened. I threw all my legal stuff under the bed and I just started going to the yard with everybody else, working out, playing basketball. You know, I'm here to die, so I might as well try to enjoy a little sunshine on the outside for an hour a day. And then I got a call from an attorney. He said he wanted to represent me on post conviction. And he had just gotten a guy off of death row about two years earlier, Mike Patton, is his name. He came to see me, read the transcript, and told me it's going to be an uphill battle, I and mean, it's going to take a while to prepare this post conviction. And prepare he did. For seven years in filing post conviction. My mom cleaned houses in order to hire expert witnesses, arson investigators, Dr. Michael Bott, forensic pathologists. Worked for years to try 
try to get the money in order to take apart the state's case with expert testimony. We did. Dr. Michael Bond, Geo Pine, the knife is five and three eighths inches long. And the stab wounds are six and four. There's no way that this knife could have caused those fatal wounds unless it got plunged all the way down through the hill. It had a hill top. And if it had ever through the hill, it would have left a mark on the skin. This knife didn't have any marks. The body did. So they, they, that is how the murder was. It wasn't thick enough, and it wasn't the right configuration. So I'm thinking, good, this is good news. Arson investigator, along with the original arson investigator, agreed this broken lamp was not broken before the fire, as David Reinhold testified to, because the crime scene pictures showed there wasn't any soot on the inside of it, it was face up, and it was bone white on the inside. But yet, everything else was covered in soot in that bedroom. So there was another lie that we can prove physically. So anyway, I filed that petition. I've been locked up about eight and a half years right now. So I'm hopeful I get an evidentiary hearing. But before I get that evidentiary hearing, Debbie Weinhold and Daryl Harrington came forward and confessed and recanted their trial testimony. They said the police and the prosecutors told them if they didn't cooperate, they would be charged with the crime. Even Debbie Weinhold signed it. Blind plea agreement, saying what she testifies to must be the truth, and the whole truth must be the truth, and she could be charged for the crime. But this was a fabricated testimony by the prosecution and the police. So I'm hopeful. Here they can. I finally get the hearing. 21 days this hearing lasted. All physical evidence, post conviction materials that I collected. Everything that we thought would gain me a new trial. The day before that hearing, Debbie Reinhold and Carol Harrington both recanted the recantation, reaffirmed their trial testimony. I walked in that hearing, there was the original prosecutor and the two dirty cops that framed me sitting on the front row looking at Debbie Reinhold and Carol Harrington. I knew it. Put your foot on her neck, so we're going to charge you with the murders if you don't recant that recantation. This happened not once, but it happened twice. Before I finally got my post conviction petition heard in front of the United States, uh, Illinois Supreme Court, they recanted again, this time on videotape. Then another evidentiary hearing, and before I could have that hearing, they recanted on the second time. The one thing's for certain, the only story that remained the same was Herb Whitlock and Randy Stockings. The witnesses, the only evidence they used against me had changed their stories now four times. Each state judge that heard each different hearing post-conviction denied me a new trial sent me back at that point. And I think, what can it, what's it going to take? I'm using the crime scene evidence that they presented against me against them. Against renowned experts that we retain. So I'm out of options. I've lost all my state appeals. The only issue I had left was the fact that my trial attorney was so involved, he didn't prepare for sentencing, aggravation, vacation. Therefore, the Illinois Supreme Court and the prosecution at the time were getting a little embarrassed at the fact that. My case has been in and out of the news media, Chicago sometimes, the Tribune, the local papers, and one episode of 48 Hours. So they were getting a little concerned about how the case looks from the public's perspective. The prosecution goes in there, they order a new sentencing hearing, the prosecution refuses to seek the death penalty again. Instead, they want to give me life without parole. So the judge agreed, gave me life without parole, so off I go after 12 years on death row, two execution days. And I now have a passive death sentence. Why well, that is that? They ignored all the actual factual evidence of my innocence. The 
and get me a passing death sentence for that. They were hoping I would lose my good attorneys, media would hopefully fade away, and I'd be gone and forgotten doing life without the world. And that didn't happen. Honest state police officer who the state police had personally retained from Chicago moved him down to Central Illinois with a promotion at five investigative agencies around him. Stellar career. He gave him three weeks to review the Rose Harder case. And after three weeks, he went to the press, the FBI, Curtis, excuse me, Illinois State Police, Curtis, and said, Listen, I want permission to open a full blown investigation on Bob Morton and Karen Rose and Porter. Because a week before she was murdered, she got the call that she went out to the parking lot to deliver to Bob Morton because he was loading machine guns and large sums of cash into the car. He derailed the world. He says, You're not supposed to be out here. This is the guy that made millions of dollars over the dog food degree and sold at night. But he was right next door to Joe Vitale, a pizzeria that was part of the International Heroin Program. And he was transported from heroin and his trucks along with the dog food. And Karen Rose was his right hand guy. And a week later, her and her husband had been savage with murder. And she went home and told her family. We didn't find out for years. But that she was scared and wanted to quit her job. And Bob told her she can't do it. All this evidence came out years later, 12, 13 years after I was convicted. I'm finally going to life without parole. <clears throat> and Mike Callahan, the state cop, was telling the Illinois Supreme Court, the Illinois Passes, that he wants to open an investigation on Bob Morton. He wanted all the powers to do that. U.S. Marshals, surveillance, and they gave him a blank check. Go ahead. After another three weeks of investigating and talking to informants about Bob Morton, he went back to him and said, Listen, I got more names. Bob Morton. His daughter, 16 year old daughter, and his wife all get tens of thousands of dollars in campaign donations to George Ryan, the former governor of Illinois, and went to prison. Well, this changed things. The Illinois uh, colonel sat back in the chairs and said, We'll get back to you. Three days later, they called me back in and said, Listen, you're to cease and desist on this investigation. We want you to be a listening post on he sat back in his chair and Mike told me, he said, never won't forget it. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I'm trying to clear this case up, trying to bring closure to the victim's family. I was trying to free two innocent men and show you who the real killer is. Again, Diane Parker, the lead colonel of the Illinois State Police, said, listen, this case is too politically sensitive and that comes from so you gotta ask yourself, where is the top? Where is the top? It's the governor's office, right? Because the Illinois State Police are the ears and the eyes of the governor's office. And George Ryan at that time already had a scandal through the license for bribe scandal. He eventually went to prison. Well, anyway, Mike Dallahan was dejected and upset. But he flew under the radar of a lot of his law enforcement people, the FBI, the U.S. Marshals, gaining more evidence. But he didn't share it with the Colonels. He shared it with my intensity. While they're preparing my federal habeas corpus petition, because that's the court of last resort, I figure I'm going to die in prison. But anyway, my attorneys got good habeas going. And before Mike Callahan retired. He was demoted to Dallas Seatbelt Tickets in Southern Illinois. He lost his illustrious investigations job. They put him back in uniform and out in seatbelt tickets. He didn't have a laptop or a phone because they found out that he was continuing to investigate over a long time. This pop was like Serpico. Anybody remember the Al Pacino movie Serpico? It's a real old movie. That's a story about an honest cop that searched for the truth. 
regardless of what kind of corruption within his own department he found. And that's what Mike Cowell had about. Destruction and corruption. And he even went to the Attorney General of the state of Illinois and took his case to that on his own time. About that same time, this was 2003, I'm waiting patiently on this federal judge. He came down with a 50 page opinion, almost verbatim, speaking about what my attorney argued about in court. There was no physical evidence tying me to the crime, had a corroborated alibi, and these witnesses had flipped to the plot and flipped to the plot, and they used Mike Callahan's investigation of this court and what they found by their boss. This same boss is the one that circulated the $25,000 reward that this mentally ill woman in this town drunk was chasing. But lo and behold, in every town, he would circulate that reward. Look what he found. Well, anyway, on 2004, May 28, I walked out of prison. The state's time clock ran out. They had to retry me or release me in 120 days. And they said there wasn't enough evidence to take me back to trial. No, because their evidence was debunked. Physically and forensically, there was no tie to me to this crime. So I guess the lesson that I've learned after spending 17 years, three months, three weeks in prison, and still having a cloud over my head when I walked out, they said they were going to call New grand jury to try to reindict me because my co defendant was still out there. He was doing life without parole, too. He got life from the get go. And his attorneys were working feverishly with mine to try to get him free, too. But it took four more years to get hurt. All because of the corruption in Illinois and how far my boss can make donations all the way to the perfect governor. <coughs> Perfect police officers and a perfect prosecutor. And you know why they can do it? Prosecutors and police officers have no accountability. They have absolute immunity for anything they do in that courtroom. And they have qualified immunity for what they do outside that courtroom. So I ask you, for those of you who might have done anything wrong in your life, you know, if they, they would give you uh, Immunity for robbing banks. What would you do for it? You rob banks. Hmm. Write bad checks. You write bad checks. See, the difference is these people rob people's lives. I'm just one of 156 men and women who have spent decades upon decades upon decades on this country's death rows for crimes they didn't commit. And we're lucky. We don't know how many were misfortunate because I was released not because of the system, I was released in spite of it. Illinois had their way up in bed. Thank God for an honest topic to stand up and face adversity, risk his job, his pension, his career. In order to get that evidence in front of a federal judge and eventually in front of an attorney general who refused to appeal the case Case went back to the state court and the state block. Can you imagine? I went from the comforts of my home to death row in 97 days. That's unheard of, especially today. But I gotta ask, how many of you here, maybe your moms and dads have, have different opinions? How many of you here believe in death row? Don't be asked. Vicious crimes. Anybody? Okay, that's one. That's another. Okay. I used to be that way too. I come from a conservative Republican family. They show guys in uniforms chained up walking from the courthouse back to the jail. They look guilty, don't they? Some of them are. Oh, there's some of them are. I believe after spending 12 years on Illinois' death row, having watched 11 men walk by my cell to be executed, and four or five of them I knew very well, I stopped at my cell, shook my hand, and all I could say to them is God speak. 
And I don't know how much they had screamed. I thought they were delusional at the time because in a few hours, I'm going to be dead. And then I realized all that done. Most of them had a smile on their face. You know why? They were being released. You really want to punish a vicious killer having done six years of life without parole, where there's more anger, more rage, more hate, and you got to watch your back. 500 in Monkey Yard. They put them in a cage for the rest of their life and make them think about the crimes they committed. And before they die, they don't repent. Then they burn in hell. That's justice. That's punishment. At least you don't risk the possibility of executing an innocent person. And we know we have. The problem is, after the execution, they don't be investigating anymore. Dirty little secret this country has. So I ask every one of you to remember if you can release an innocent man to prison, I'm living proof of that. But you can't release him from his grave. Thank you very much.